Lucky you. 36 Turn pistols and golf. Alternate Shots Podcast. Barney's Army. Where we talk about golf. Sandy. Poker. James Bond. Horse racing. Double. Classic movies. Zenyatta. We have no script. Down the stretch they come. We are glad you joined us. Frankly, my dear, I don't give a damn. <laughs> okay, Billy Regan, today we have a really interesting episode. Two dopes doping out the master of suspense. Who else but would that be but Alfred Hitchcock? Absolutely. 53 movies in 50 years. And I don't think there's a bad one in the lot. But they cover all kinds of ground from, you know, lifeboat to spies to, you know, parlor murder cases. Any, anything you uh, anything you could think of, he touched on one way or the other. Jewel Thieves. He was the best. Probably the most prolific director of all time. And unfortunately, in today's day and age, the youngsters may never even know who he was. What's your favorite movie? My favorite Hitchcock movie? Uh, yep. I'm a fan of them. And, uh, you know, because of, because of Hitchcock and the, and the number of years he spanned, you know, there, you know, depends what kind of mood you're in. You can go to the uh, dynamic color that's in the trouble with Harry and North by Northwest. And they're, you know, both of them have their different versions of suspense. Or you can go way back in time to the atmospheric 39 steps or foreign correspondent. Both of which movies I think are unbelievably good. Foreign correspondent is Joel McRae. Or the decade he filmed the uh, movie in was limiting to what he could do. And in Frenzy, which I think was in the early 70s, he had more tricks in his kit to use than in 39 Steps. That's correct. And the same thing with Family Plot. The Bruce Dern movie might have been one of his last ones. Bruce Dern and William Devane. Even though we may have three different favorite first movies if you go on that basis is suspense suspense was his middle name hitchcock had if he had 75 great films he had 75 different versions of suspense right absolutely and he he analyzed suspense in in two different ways he said there's 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 two distinct approaches to suspense you can you know blow up a bomb all of a sudden and the audience will jump in their seats and everybody will be shocked. But if you really want to add suspense to that, you tell the audience there's a bomb and where it is and when it's going to go off. And then they'll be wriggling in their seats the whole time, you know, trying to anticipate whether the good guys are going to stop the bomb or not. I think he said he made a mistake in the movie Sabotage where he showed the audience the bomb you know, and it was in a, a little girl's lunchbox. Yep. On a bus. And then it blew up. And he said the, the, the audience did not like that. <laughs> so they wanted to, they didn't want the little girl to blow up. And, you know, they were doubly surprised when it actually happened because they didn't believe anybody would actually let the little girl blow up. So he may have rethought that, but he didn't change that movie. Yeah. And then and, everybody who came after him, your guy, uh, Cody Gifford's guy and my guy, Guy Ritchie love him happened to see his movie covenant and in the beginning of the movie there's a scene where they're at a checkpoint he and his bomb detection crowd they're looking for bombs but they're really looking for where they're making the bombs the ieds the explosive devices right and they find a truck and the guy's giving him a hard time he's calling the uh, interpreter a bad name you're going with the wrong guys and and then the guy gets truck driver gets out of his truck and that's where the suspense comes in you already know jake gillianthal and his troop are looking for bombs so that's in your head and now you're starting to think "Uh uh-oh and that's suspense but that's a version off of what uh, alfred hitchcock did in one or many of his movies and then in the untouchables with kevin costner you know where they put a bomb in the in the in the bar in the speakeasy and the little girl picks up the case and says, you forgot your thing. And then she blows up. Rear window, rather. And the part toward the end where they go into uh, Raymond Burr's apartment. He's watching them. He's watching. He's got a broken leg. He's in a wheelchair. He's across the courtyard in another apartment. Thelma Ritter's going somewhere else. Helpless. His girlfriend, Grace Kelly, who came out with 10 different dresses in the course of an hour and a half movie. Do you? <laughs> But it was written into the part. You know, they, she would always read. How much is that dress? 
fifteen hundred dollars. Well, they should put that on the stock exchange. But the suspense in that part of the movie was when Raymond Burr finds her in his apartment looking for evidence, clues that he killed his wife. Right. And you're sitting there. You're just sitting there. That poor little Grace Kelly, who probably was ninety nine and a half pounds of 100% beauty and he's got his hands all over her. She's flipping the, uh, she flips the, you know, wiggles her finger with the ring on it. That Raymond Burr yeah. spot. Yeah, that's what gave away. That's the other part of the movie that gave away where Jimmy Stewart was. He finally figured out where, where yeah, the, look, yeah, the bad guy was. And then there's more suspense in that movie too. He's walking up the stairs. Burr's coming up, clump 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 right and it's dark and jimmy stewart's got the lights off in his apartment his only he, defense is flash cubes the flash cubes is his only defense what's great about this is it's like you said it's like a one parlor film well it's all taken from the window yeah we never get out of that apartment raymond burr maybe one of the most underrated actors of all time he was he was a hero to everybody in perry mason but he could be a really bad, bad guy. And he did that in a, in a bunch of films. And he's almost unrecognizable in Rear Window. He, he, he really comes across as as scary because he's not like a vicious kind of person. But he, you know, he's a fed up guy who had the capacity to murder his wife and cut her up and, you know, take her out in pieces. My hat's off to him uh, for his job in that movie. What about the overnight bag, Billy? Yeah, and, the, and all the uh, implications. Wendell Corey shoots at them while James Stewart's saying, careful, careful here. Careful, careful, Tom. Grace Kelly, she was a beautiful woman, and she had the presence. I, I mean, I, I would love to have seen her in person at some point. I'm sure when she walked into a room, the, the, the place stopped. Yeah, some, some people have that kind of effect. And, Grace Kelly was an excellent actress. She ne she never overdid it, <clears throat> and uh, Hitchcock loved her. You know, he used her in uh, it, To Catch a Thief and Island for Murder as well. All t different sort of parts that she yep. maxed. That she maxed. If people don't think Grace Kelly was a yep. great actress, they're missing out on a lot. Yeah, she even was able to do High Society, the remake of the Philadelphia story with Bing Crosby and uh, Frank Sinatra. And she held her own in that, and even though it was a musical, she wasn't a musical part of it, but she was. She did a very good acting job. I wouldn't want to go past Thelma Ritter here. She's one of my favorite character actors, and you and I loved character actors over the years, and there's still character actors today. But when she came in, you know what the penalty is uh, for peeping Toms? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Walks in. She's she's just bossing him around, and then she gives him a you know, a massage, and she puts the cold oil on him. Don't you ever heat that up? And she says no. It gives your circulation something to fight against. <laughs> yeah. What did she have? Four minutes, five minutes. Well, maybe five minutes total in that movie, and every second was memorable. Yeah, well, she's in and out of it because she's in on the the uh, the whole thing and the digging up the bones and stuff like that. So. Yeah, she's probably the third main character on the good guy side. She's as as present in the movie as Wendell Corey. No in, the, in the whole, you know. And, and her her personality where she wants to get in, in, in. And then the then at the end of the show, when Corey says to her, do you want to go and, uh, you know, look at the, where all the pieces of the body are buried? I wouldn't want any part of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> about the suspense that Hitchcock introduces through all of his films and how current um, directors like a Guy Ritchie is leveraging that and using those kind of things as maybe he's inspired by Hitchcock. We'd like to interview him and find out. We talked about Rear Window. There's a killer in that. The birds, there's birds or killers in that. Uh, you're going to talk about Young and Innocent and Dial M for Murder. We already talked about that. There's clearly a killer in that. But what about what about this kind of genre here? This uh, this disturbed kind of psycho genre. Well, psycho, psycho put Hitchcock on the map um, at, for a lot of younger people at the time. So I, I guarantee you, there's a, a whole raft of people, maybe my age, who saw Psycho that don't know 
that was Alfred Hitchcock. They just know it was a scary movie and the scary movie of the day because it really was, uh, a, the guy was psycho. And you didn't see a lot of that. You, you know, they had the Boston Strangler. And it, there, it was out there. But the way Hitchcock presented that movie with Janet Lee, and Janet Lee's the, the star of the movie, and she gets killed halfway through. Uh, his producers and the centers in the movie industry were very tough from what we've seen about, and they didn't know the movie could be made. And he said, you'll never, you know, you watch what I do with that. You'll never see what you think. But the the, the visual is there, right? <laughs> As Jane Russell would say, she was a full figure girl, which she, she was. Her. And 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 it goes further. There was, there's probably two or three scenes in there where she is in her in her bra. I don't think it was gratuitous, but but the classic scene and she's in the shower getting stabbed I, how many times at that with that high pitched music going on. <laughs> and the camera work in that scene with the uh, in the shower scene is unbelievable. The quick cuts back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And then to start on a tight shot of her eye when she's lying on the floor. And twist and zoom back out until you're in the room, getting a look at the newspaper where the MacGuffin is, the MacGuffin being the $40,000. <laughs> in case people don't understand what Hitchcock called the MacGuffin, it was the thing that everybody in the movie was chasing after, whether it was jewels or secret formulas or information or money. But the audience doesn't care what it is, just as long as there, there's something for the, you know, protagonists to pursue the good guys and the bad guys both to pursue so hitchcock called that the mcguffin in this case it's it's like the catalyst is the forty thousand dollars that she stole and again all black and white even though this movie poster is in color the movie was 100 percent black and white it was 1960 but there was plenty of color movies by then think about the shower scene how how different it would have been if it was in color with red. The, the object of the shower scene, the thing that makes it so compelling is that you don't see, it's not gory. You perceive goriness, but you don't see goriness. You know, in today's day and age, they'd show you the, you know, the, the knife going in and the blood squirting out. You know, that, that's fine for that kind of movie. But Hitchcock managed to have that kind of violence. You didn't see it. You, you saw it and you imagined it, but you didn't actually see the, you know, the, the, like I say, the blood squirting all over the place. You saw it go down the drain. You yes. saw it slash here and there, but it wasn't like, you know, Friday the 13th. You also talk about the birds. Hippie Hedron, yeah. Hippie Hedron, another blonde, another beauty. Yeah, with uh, Jessica Tandy, the ruthless mother, which they got into a little bit, but the movie wasn't about Jessica Tandy. The mother would crucify yeah. any date he brought home, except... Tippy Hedron, right? She sort of liked Tippy Hedron at the end as they're getting pecked by the blackbirds. <laughs> she she resented her at first. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she wanted Rod, Rod Taylor to stick it out with uh, Suzanne Plachette, the school teacher, but that mm -hmm. didn't work. But, but what I was saying is Tippy Hedron is actually Melanie Griffith's mother in, in, uh, in real life. Oh, is that right? Oh, yeah. I love that. that's great. Well, that you could see the likeness, right? Yeah, you can when you think about it. Yep. Be beautiful scenery, though. The scenery there is... The scenery is... That's what Hitchcock did in the birds. He, there was no answer. There was no solution. The, the guys you're watching, Rod Taylor and his mother and the, and the and his sister and Tippi Hedren get out of there. But the problem is it has not been solved. Nobody, you know, figured out how to get the birds to stop attacking people. They, he left you with that. Well, as a kid, the movie ended like that. I was thinking... Well, if I ever build a house, I'm building it with, you know, steel shutters. And the whole thing of that movie is no one knows why this happens and, and they don't tell you. But the scene at the school, that's there's there's probably no better scene to describe Alfred Hitchcock and, and the kind of mind he had and the kind of imagination he had for when she's sitting out there having a cigarette, waiting for the kids to get out of school and the black crows are accumulating little by little on the jungle gym. They're accumulating like Swifties at a Taylor Swift concert. They're just millions of them. Little kids in that school and there's no windows. Right. Great scene. Young and Innocent is an old one um, where 
as the title implies, uh, somebody gets murdered. The bad guy is a drummer in a band and he's got a twitch in his eye. Hitchcock uses later on on a close up. But the wrong guy gets blamed. He's he, you know, he's kind of a cocky, arrogant guy that is on the loose and they're all looking for him. And he's trying to figure out who did the murder. He hooks up with a uh, prim and proper young lady whose father would be appalled that, that she was talking to a guy who didn't wear a tie to a tea party and stuff like that. So, And it's a short one and it's it's very good and early. It's a guy you they think he's going to get away. They don't really know who he is. There's a trench coat they have. that That's why they think this guy did it because he got strangled with the trench coat belt. And the guy has a trench coat and he lost his belt. So, But we know it's not him. We know who it is and how close they keep coming to getting to him. And that's the suspense. Hitchcock could get that suspense going without actually ever showing you violence. But in most movies, somebody got the wrong end of the stick, even in Dial M for Murder, which was remade by Douglas and Gwyneth Paltrow called The Perfect Murder. And it's a really very, very good remake of uh, Dial M for Murder. It's updated and it's different, but it's the same concept. The motivation is the same. He needs money. Yeah, but there's wrinkles in it. Yeah. You know, the guy that he hires to murder his wife hires someone else to do it. Yeah, that's right. So they, you know, the wrong guy gets killed. You know, it's it's pretty interesting. And it's what's the guy's name? Vigo Mortensen. That's the guy. Yep. Vigo Mortensen. Vigo Mortensen has an affair with her. This is the trouble with Harry. You look, we're looking at the movie poster, and prominently displayed in, in the poster is Edmund Gwynn. He was famous in a lot of movies, but just about everybody will know him at Miracle on 34th Street. Chris Kringle, that's right. Oh. Kelly Forsyth is a fabulous actor. And Shirley MacLaine, this is, I think you mentioned, this is kind of her entree into the movies, right? First movie. John Forsyth, who wasn't a big star, but he was he was a very competent actor, went on to be Bachelor Father in a TV series back in the 50s or 60s. Then he went on, probably best known for being the voice of Charlie on Charlie's Angels. That was probably his big break. But you mentioned that, that the colors in the, in New England with this picture is almost as interesting as the plot line and the suspense. It, 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 to me, it's the it's the main attraction to that movie. The, the acting's great. The plot's good. And there's a, it's kind of humorous. They keep digging up the body, putting it back. Nobody knows who killed you know, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> Shirley MacLaine's ex-husband. <clears throat> But the colors are just so magnificent that it just makes you. And you know who else is in that movie is uh, Beaver, Jerry Mathers. He's the little kid. He's the little kid before uh, before Leave It to Beaver. He, he did this. You're right. It's it's a different form of suspense. And they keep moving the body around. And somebody just comes close to seeing the body. There's the policeman. How casual everybody is about the body. Put him in the bathtub. We got him, Now we got to iron his pants. You know, the whole thing is it's, it's very good. And John Forsyth plays this carefree artist who can't make a dime. And somebody comes along and wants to buy all his paintings, but he doesn't care about the money. It's very, it's a very fun, pleasant movie to watch with more of a humorous suspense than a, you know, than an edge of your seat suspense. So you go to wide open spaces and this particular plot to a one room sh movie, Rope. I think in the entire movie, there might be only two cuts. Otherwise, it's done in succession by one camera. They, uh, they never cut to a second. They cut in the very beginning when you hear the noise from outside the apartment. They cut right. to inside. But after that, it's one camera the whole way. And, and back then, the reels, I think, were 20 minutes long. So when somebody walked in front of the camera, stay there. They switch the reel. When they're ready to go again, the guy keeps walking. So you don't you don't see that delay because it, on screen, it's just you yes. know, the camera's blocked by the guy's back as he walks. Five, but it's a split second when, it, when it's after it's uh, edited. The guy uh, John Dahl, he's a little psycho too. He's not the same kind of psycho as Anthony Perkins, but he's a little off his nut. He's doing this to prove superiority and blah 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 blah. But the, but the way Hitchcock shot that is, <clears throat> he used stuff like the swinging kitchen door. Yep. So you have the shot of the guy walking in the kitchen, the door closing behind him, and as it swings back open. You see him dropping the rope in the drawer, and then it swings back closed and opening again as he comes back out. So the timing on that had to be, you got to remember that he's not hes not using more than one camera, so it's not it can't be more than one take. So that had to be 
you know, perfectly done, and it was. But that rope is also a, an actor in in the movie. It shows up in the beginning. He then puts it back, yeah. and then later on, he gives the uh, older gentleman the books tied up with the murder. All of it while Farley Granger is about to bust. Again, it's these touches that Hitchcock had in his movies that are they develop the characters in in such a way that it's it's very unique. And you see Farley Granger get more and more edgy and more and more on the brink. And then, you know, they bring up something he's very sensitive about, which is killing a chicken or whatever he had to do when he was a kid. You know, and that just shows you more of how, you know, how crazy these two guys are. And Farley Granger was also one of the characters. Granger's on the later. Right. So Marnie and uh, To Catch a Thief are interesting because, again, the scenery in the Catch a Thief. Where the fireworks are going on outside, Cary Grant and Grace Kelly are inside, and she's got some jewelry on, and she says to him, and, and it's, you know, she's got some uh, a low-cut dress with a diamond necklace. And she says, even in this light, I can see where your eyes are looking. So we're getting into the third part of our little discussion here about great Hitchcock films, and one of my favorites is North by Northwest. Billy, I don't know about you. Oh, North by Northwest is, you know, cream of the crop. Great actors, great actors in that movie. James Mason, Cary Grant, Eva Marie Saint. That was early for her, too. I think On the Waterfront was her first movie, but this wasn't long after that. She's she's just terrific in that movie. Leo G. Carroll, who, who might have been in more Hitchcock movies than any other one actor. Very few opening scenes in movies better than the first few minutes of Forget about James Bond. We love the opening scenes of James Bond. But from a Hitchcock's perspective, the amount of miles covered and the voyage and the journey, you know, I love going on journeys in movies. I, I just love like that Mission Impossible new movie. It's such a great movie because you're never standing still. The action is never stopping. And then North by Northwest, this is what, 50 years ago, 60 years ago, this movie? 60 Something years like yeah. yeah. And the technology it didn't have then, but you said he's getting dusted by crop dusters. And it makes you want to go back on a train again, because right off the bat, they're on a train, right? And it's kind of cool. You yeah. know, or a little Gibson, a little small martini. They're like, the, the, the martinis then, maybe nobody got drunk because they were the size of thimbles you would use for sewing. And then you had the trout. Who would think about ordering trout on Metro North? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. They had that red carpet train out of Grand Central right there by the Oyster Bar. You would go in in the afternoon, like five o'clock or whatever. You get on the train and when you woke up in the morning, you were in Chicago. So that was the way to go. First class. That's why yeah. this, this this poster has a red uh, north by northwest sort of carpet. That's where. But the, the movement in that and the scenery in that. Trains are great scenery uh, in movies. There's there's a lot of pivotal scenes and uh, movies that take place on trains and, and across all Sherlock Holmes, uh, you know, Terror by Night, I think was the name of it, where there's the pearl thief and the pearl and everybody on the train and the murders are taking place in, in that confined environment. So it becomes very interesting to try and figure out, you know, who's who and where and what. Good what stage. Happens. You can even go into comedies. Preston Sturgis is the Palm Beach story where Claudette Colbert is running away from Joel McRae on a train, and William Demers is part of a bunch of hunting, drunk hunting guys with dogs and everything like that. They're shooting up the train. It, it's, it's a hilarious scene, and it takes place on the train. Which it's, it's, it's very... Uh, trains are great. How about something like an hot? There's the train scene I was just going to say, there's probably yeah. my favorites for a different reason, because it's so hilarious what happens, the cocktail party with the sausage and the crackers uh, happens in the upper bunk. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How many women did they have in, who was it, uh, Jack Lemon's bunk? <laughs> the, they must, that must have been, two guys must have had more fun making that movie. How about The Man Who Knew Too Much? That was another one with the journey, right? Was it Morocco? We start yeah. on a bus in Morocco or something like that? Yep, it ends up at Ambrose Chapel and then into uh, Albert Hall, right? Yeah, what a great place to end a movie in Albert Hall. We need to include a number of very important films that Hitchcock did. And I think, generally speaking, they're in the genre of spy movies. So those would be Suspicion, which we're looking at here, Foreign Correspondent, 
the 39 steps and saboteur right that's correct those are four very good black and white atmospheric suspenseful movies um and for diff different kinds of suspense foreign correspondent is joel mccray playing a war correspondent in england prior basically prior to world war ii but it's coming and um uh, you know, bad guys are trying to kidnap, I think succeed in kidnapping uh, a, a, a diplomat who's instrumental in drawing up a peace pact. And they want, they need to know the, the secret. The MacGuffin in that movie is the secret provision. So they kidnap this guy and they're trying to find out, you know, the missing step so they can have an advantage in the war they're trying to start, the Germans. Saboteur again is the germans don't remember the actor's name but his uh his name in the movie is fry who frames robert cummings for blowing up a munitions factory or something oh, like wow. that you know robert cummings is being chased while he's trying to find the bad guys otto kruger's in that that's that's a great movie that ends on the statue of liberty in typical hitchcock fashion very suspenseful with the guy hanging from the statue of liberty Robert Cummings, they're climbing around actually, like in North by Northwest, where they're climbing around on Mount Rushmore. If you're queasy about heights, you, this is a hard one to watch. But it's a great scene where Robert Cummings is trying to actually hold the bad guy who's slipped. And he's holding him by his sleeve, and you start seeing the sleeve rip, you know, thread by thread by thread. And, and the guy sees it ripping. He's like, sleeve. And the next thing you know, he's gone. And the, and the way they they shot that was great. Excellent movie. Oh, we're talking about Suspicion. It's an old movie. And it's an old movie, and there's, and there's no murder in that one. There's no murder it's, in that, but you don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a death in that, but everything is, uh, oh, it looks like it's going back to Cary Grant, and then he gets out of it. And Leo G. Carroll's in that one. Yeah. Nigel Bruce. He just plays a happy-go-lucky guy, and everything points to him going to, you know, going to kill Joan Fontaine, his wife, including that excellent scene again, Hitchcockian, where he's walking up the stairs with the glass of milk, and it looks like a spider web, oh, the yeah. shadow stuff on the uh, on the stairs. I feel like in the old movies, you never wanted to drink the warm milk. Never drink the warm milk. Never, never drink the warm milk. That's exactly right. Like. Like don't a, drink the milk it's spoiled like the little rascals don't. 39 steps which i think might be one of the more in the top five classic hitchcock movies robert donat the, the whole premise which is an old hitchcock premise the innocent guy gets dragged into something that and it turns out that he's he's more capable than the bad guys so you know it, it, Cary Grant gets dragged in as an innocent guy in, the, in North by Northwest and ends up toppling them. And it's the same thing with Robert Donat and the 39 Steps. Uh, but the unique thing about the 39 Steps is the character who knows all the information is a vaudeville uh, actor called Mr. Memory. <laughs> and, and he can remember anything. So the, the 39 Steps is a formula or a plan Again, the MacGuffin that nobody cares what it is, but just as long as it's something that Mr. Memory has memorized. And a, a long way around, they get back to the London Palladium and Robert Donat has figured out, you know, how the thing works. And, the, you know, they showed you earlier in the movie, you just asked Mr. Memory a question. How far is it from Dover to Sussex? Or 189 miles. The, the, the guy like knows everything. So this one ends up with Robert Donat figuring it all out, getting back there going, what are the 39 steps? What are the 39 steps? And, and the guy starts saying them and all hell breaks loose. You opened up the formula, and that was the whole premise of the plot in Torn Curtain. Paul, Newman and Ju Paul Newman's a scientist, supposed to be a crack U.S. scientist that uh, is defecting, and he makes friends with the guy who does know the formula. He puts his own idea on the wall, as yeah, the other guy's like, no, 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 you got it, you know. Oh, no. Here, yeah. I'm showing you with my hands. He's erasing the board and all that. And he gets yeah. up there in the professorial, you know, chalkboard, and he writes it all down. <laughs> and Newman is then memorizing it. I neglected to mention Notorious, which is another spy movie. So where's the suspense in Notorious? 
they coerced Ingrid Bergman to go marry Claude Rains, the bad guy, and Claude Rains' his mother's, you know, and there's a, you know, the guy with the German guy with the scar, all the bad guys hanging out at Claude Rains' house, finally figure out what she's doing. They slowly start to poison her again with the warm milk. <clears throat> so the suspenses can carry Grant, get her out of that house. Made 53 in 50 years. So he was, he was cranking them out. He knew how to do it. You know, he made all those movies. And yet from a financial perspective, if you watch some of these biographers, um making psycho i think it was psycho was the one that he had to have to get solvent you know to live the life the scotch that he bought you know the expensive liquor that he bought and the way he lived he you know i would love to know what was really going on in his mind all the time i mean people say he was macabre and you know whatever he was very funny if you watch the old show alfred hitchcock presents He's a very funny guy. He had a sense of humor, whether it was in the dark side or not. It was He saw the humor and stuff. And I think he pointed that out in The Trouble with Harry. There's a lot of humor there surrounding a dead body. So, Why don't you retell the story when he was a youngster and his father told him to do something? His father gave him a note and told him to go around to the police station and hand it to the, the sergeant behind the desk. He was five or six years old. So he does what his father says. And then the, the sergeant comes out from behind the desk, takes little Alfred Hitchcock in the back and locks him in a cell for five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. And then lets him out and Hitchcock goes home and his father says, that was to teach you never to trust anybody. <laughs> That's going to be an indelible kind of a, a thing. You know, that that lesson probably was learned. If my father gave me a note on my fifth birthday. I probably would have ended up with a nice cream cone at the end of it. Not being locked in a cell. If you had one film, no matter what mood you're in, no matter what era, black and white, color, spy, murder, if you had to get down to one film and you have to answer the question, what's your favorite? What's that one film from Hitchcock? Foreign Correspondent. With Very Joel McRae and Lorraine Day. And uh, what's the guy's name? The funny character. I can't remember his name right now, but um, and and uh, Herbert Marshall, you know the sad the sad sack. Herbert Marshall plays Lorraine Day's father, and Edmund Gwen is in there too. He plays an assassin. That to me, that, that's that's got every aspect you want. And George Sanders, of of uh, of Hitchcock that you that that you'd ever want, including a great scene in the windmill. Foreign correspondent would be it. Yeah, I'm looking. I, I have a hard time like you, but if push and I'm being pushed here, I would have to say North by Northwest. And the reason is it's probably the most watched one I've done. I've watched it over and over again. But the the way you go on little journeys and the scenery, you start in uh, the Plaza Hotel right in the Oak Bar. You end up at the UN. See, well, yeah, I could never disagree with you. Who was better, Hank Aaron or Willie Mays? It's the same idea. In my top 50 movies, there's probably 20 Hitchcocks. Hitchcock looked through the, the lens himself on every shot. He never, he, you know, he told the guy what he wanted or the guy said, how about this, wherever the cameraman was. I'm sure he had his favorite. I don't know who they are off the top of my head. But I know Hitchcock, I saw him in interviews years ago saying that he got behind the camera himself and looked through that lens to see the shot before he was happy with it to make sure it was what he wanted. He used suspense passively, actively, visually, invisibly, any way you can. It's just nobody's been able to create suspense uh, in a movie as many ways as he has. No, and not only just, not just only one way in each movie, there's several, it's not one suspenseful moment. There's suspense builds and builds and builds. In North by Northwest, it's suspenseful. How's he going to get out of the auction? It builds, it builds, it builds. You're shortchanging yourself if you like movies and not have seen at least one time each of these movies that we've talked about, as well as the other 20 that we didn't cover. I agree. Totally agree. 53 movies in 50 years. And I don't think there's a bad one in the lot. Alfred Hitchcock, to me, was the be-all and end-all of, of knowing how to make a movie, even with a very simple plot. 
I, he was great with the ironic twists and turns, but with the suspense, he was, no one's better. No one, no one will ever be better than him. But they cover all kinds of ground, from lifeboat to spies to parlor murder cases. Anything you could think of, he touched on one way or the other. Jewel thieves. He was the best. Probably the most prolific director of all time. And unfortunately, in today's day and age, the youngsters may never even know who he was. Thanks for joining Casper, us today. Billy Horner. We really appreciate your Double feedback. Double indemnity. And please, Marky, subscribe to the show. Ratter, and hit Claude the bell Harmon, icon so you get notified. Movie classics. Of new episodes. Mark Gable. Hit him hard. Job. And hit him off. That's 36 holes.